As Macau celebrates the 20th anniversary of its return to China, its GDP has increased almost nine times. Its GDP per capita is second richest in the world. It may soon become first, the richest place on earth. How to explain Macau's success? We must Credit is given to China's one country, two systems policy. How does the policy work in Macau? And how does the Macau experience compare with that of Hong Kong? Looking to the future, how long will one country, two systems last? 50 years or forever. This week, we assess Macau after 20 years and China's policy of one country, two systems to be closer to China. December 20th, 2019 marks the 20th anniversary of Macau's return to China. By all accounts, the two decades have brought to Macau what is now called the Macau Special Administrative Region, unprecedented success. According to the World Bank, Macau's GDP increased almost nine times from 6.7 billion U.S. dollars in 2000 to 54.6 billion U.S. dollars in 2018, an annual growth rate of over 12 percent. Macau's GDP per capita is second or third richest in the world, and it looks to become the first the richest per capita place on earth. A prime reason, of course, is Macau's gambling industry, which is the largest in the world, seven times larger than Las Vegas's. But is Macau now over-reliant on gambling? How can Macau diversify its development, leverage its unique advantages, particularly as part of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area integrated regional plan? Moreover, in assessing Macau's undeniable accomplishments, China credits its policy of one country, two systems. How does this fundamental principle of governance work in Macau? How does the Macau experience compare with that of Hong Kong? How important for China is one country, two systems? We find out to be closer to China. At the stroke of midnight on December 20th, 1999, while the Chinese national anthem, March of the Volunteers, played, China's flag was raised. After 400 years, Macau officially returned to the embrace of the motherland. From then on, Macau had a new name, Macau's Special Administrative Region. On this small enclave of about 30 square kilometers of land, 660,000 citizens reside. They speak Mandarin, Cantonese, Portuguese, and English. Macau is a world-famous gambling capital, a well-known international tourist city, and an important platform for cultural exchanges between China and the West. Located on China's southern coast, Macau has close economic exchanges with the mainland. Facing the world, it serves as a bridge for trade and cultural exchanges with Portuguese-speaking countries that have populations of over 260 million, including Brazil and Portugal. Since the handover, Macau has opened wide and attracted more people. Macau's society and economy and people's livelihoods have all improved substantially. Today, after 20 years' development, Macau's GDP per capita exceeds 80,000 U.S. dollars, ranking second or third in the world. Its fiscal reserves have hit 75 billion U.S. dollars, equivalent to six years of public expenditures. And its unemployment rate is only 1.8 percent, close to full employment. In the first half of 2019, Macau's inbound tourists exceeded 20 million. In just one generation, how has Macau accomplished so much? What's the basis of such prosperity and stability? What changes and challenges lie ahead? On December 20th, 1999, Macau returned to the motherland. What was the attitude of the Macau people at that time? From 1993 to year 2000, uh, the economy has been really, really bad. 
and the social order has been very disruptive. And so people are longing for some kind of stability and some kind of growth. So when the handover comes in, uh, actually, you know, everybody is rejoiced and happy. And some even say, you know, this should have come a year or two earlier. Why did Macau achieve such great developments in just 20 years' time, one generation? What factors contributed to it? The reason behind the achievements of present-day Macau is clearly interwoven with the development of the state. Macau has its limitations, due mainly to geography. Its total land mass merely reaches 32 square kilometers, despite the continuous process of reclaiming land from the sea. Over the past 20 years, the central government in Beijing has authorized this special administrative region, called SAR, five special provisions since its return in 1999. Since since then, the scope of Macau's jurisdiction has gradually expanded. More recently, the State Council has introduced 25 additional measures, including tax exemptions and reductions to encourage Macau youth to start businesses on the mainland. In Hongqin, an island of Zhuhai City, for example, it now charges only a nominal fee for office rent, well below the market rates, for young entrepreneurs from Macau. To attract more talented newcomers, Hongqin offers preferential policies on taxes, office rent, and subsidies for new specialties. This is a vital aspect of providing promising prospects for Macau's youth. In terms of size and scale, Macau occupies an area of only about 30 square kilometers and has a population of less than 700,000. In fact, it is very small. Why then does the central government attach great importance to the region and strongly support it? In China's national development, what is Macau's strategic position? Macau must be seen from the perspective of the state's overall development, its progress so far, and its strategy moving forward. The principle of one country, two systems, is vital in governing our country and one of the components to build a great modern country. Macau's success within this system is part of a broader commitment to the peaceful unification with the motherland. So, although Macau is small in size, it's of great symbolic importance to our peaceful unification. Coming up next, what is China's one country, two systems policy? Why does it work in Macau? Without one country, two systems, what would Macau be like today? All this and more next on Closer to China. On December 20th, 1999, the Chinese government resumed exercising sovereignty over Macau. Since then, Macau began to implement the principles of one country, two systems, and Macau people governing Macau, enjoying a high degree of autonomy. Under one country, two systems, Macau has transformed itself from a small port village into a world tourist city. Under one country, two systems, Macau and Zhuhai City, adjacent on the mainland, are moving toward urban integration in which exchanges of all forms of economic and social activities are optimized. What is Macau's status today? Its economy is vigorous and dynamic. Its political systems have developed steadily. The social environment remains stable and people's livelihoods have well improved. Macau attributes its historic accomplishments to the one country, two systems principle. What is China's one country, two systems policy? For what reason was it formulated? One country, two systems was designated to retain the capitalist system of certain special regions, while the Chinese mainland continues to implement the socialist system within the People's Republic of China. In other words, two systems coexisting within one country. More specifically, the policy was devised to ensure a shared peace and prosperity among Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, and the mainland. Although each of the two systems plays its own role in its own territory, the parallel operation of the two systems is no doubt a huge challenge for the ruling party and for national governance. Since it is difficult to manage, why does the central government still insist on it? Can it be replaced by one country, one system? Long ago, when discussing one country, two systems, leader Deng Xiaoping repeatedly emphasized two points. Respect for history 
and conformity to realities. What does respect for history mean? For more than 100 years, Macau was ruled by the Portuguese. It implemented a different system than the mainland. We must respect this history. At the same time, we must consider its realities. This system has a beneficial role to play in Macau today. Macau residents accept this system, and they also hope their lifestyle remains unchanged within this system. If we go against the will of Hong Kong and Macau residents, their interests may not be guaranteed. Of course, we also ask Hong Kong and Macau residents to respect the state system, for this is where our national interests lie. What Deng Xiaoping said about one country, two systems, means that both the interests of the state and those of Hong Kong and Macau must be taken care of. Therefore, I think one country, two systems is still the best choice at this stage. Is the one country, two systems policy really the best choice? What can we learn from the practice over the years? So how should the practice of one country, two systems policy in Macau be evaluated? Basically successful. We can evaluate how the policy has been implemented and practiced on a daily basis to determine how successful it's been. When we talk about national sovereignty, it's important to defend the jurisdiction of the central government. One country is not just about territorial integrity, but it's also about the unification of national sovereignty. As part of China, Macau must be led by the central government, which in turn must exercise all authority. That exercise of power must be able to be in forced within the Macau SAR. In this regard, Macau has done a good job. Macau particularly emphasizes its constitutional responsibility to safeguard national security. By now, Hong Kong has yet to enact its local laws regarding Article 23 of the Basic Law. Meanwhile, in Macau, its national security law came into effect in 2009. And in 2018, Macau established its National Security Committee headed by the chief executive. If we look at it from the development of the state, Macau actively integrates itself into the state's development and simultaneously supports it, including bringing its own advantages to the Belt and Road Initiative. Second, over the past 20 years, in terms of social order, Macau has not experienced any large-scale movements that have adversely affected social stability. Generally speaking, Macau is a very peaceful and harmonious society. The political system is also quite stable. The key is the relationship between the executive and the legislative bodies, not only as a system of check and balance, but also their necessary cooperation. If the legislature were to confront the chief executive-led government with filibustering every day, it would definitely affect societal stability. Yet, this phenomenon does not occur in Macau. If the government does the right thing, the legislative assembly will support it. If the government is inactive, the Legislative Assembly will supervise and press the government to improve. Another criteria is economic development. In Macau, sustained growth over the past two decades has proved the strength of the one country, two systems. Well, I think as time goes on, we can really see the system is getting better for Macau side, at least. Because like SIPA, like, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the, the policies that actually help Macau to get from bad to even now to better. This is something Macau needs. Hong Kong and Macau are both special administrative regions under the one country, two systems policy, but at present the practice of the policy differs significantly. Why? Macauers have strong patriotic sentiments. While well, ever since British rule, the Hong Kong SAR government has emphasized civic education to observe laws and disciplines, while largely ignoring a more national education. As a result, many Hong Kongers have this feeling of being neither Chinese nor British, neither Oriental nor Western. Against such a backdrop, some Hong Kongers, especially some elites, don't have as deep an understanding or appreciation of the state as do Macau's residents. What's more, economic data could indicate sound growth for a state or region. But what we must ensure is that during this process of development, the general public can share these dividends. More often than not, the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a small group of people, leaving the majority of society less satisfied, or they struggle more to make ends meet since they cannot share the benefits of development. In this aspect, Macau has done a great job.
I see it from two aspects. One is the specific institutional arrangements. Since the Basic Law of Macau was drafted after the Basic Law of Hong Kong, we had that first experience for our reference. Besides, the Portuguese didn't cause much trouble for the Chinese government when they left. Therefore, we could make the original system more compatible with the Basic Law. This connection leads to a smoother transition. There is another difference. For example, the Basic Law of Macau empowers the chief executive to draw up administrative regulations. In this way, the Macau SAR government's power can be deployed more fully, which is also quite different from Hong Kong. Also important is that besides the system, strict enforcement of the Basic Law is crucial. The Basic Law of Macau is built on the Basic Law of Hong Kong, but it's different in practice. Hong Kong, especially opposition members of the parliament, have distorted the provisions of the Basic Law. They've changed it beyond recognition and now have run counter to what the government had envisioned. Hong Kong did just that, but Macau hasn't followed suit. The Legislative Assembly of Macau added a crucial sentence when it formulated its procedural rules. The government enjoys the exclusive right to propose specific motions and subsequent motions. Another important factor is whether the support of the system's operation is strong enough. In Macau, the executive, legislative, and judicial teams all have patriots atop the main body. If patriots run the system, the system operates rather smoothly. What do you think went wrong with Hong Kong? What is the factor that has led most directly, in your opinion, to the breakout of the protests? After 22 years since the handover, the political situation in Hong Kong is now worse than at any time. Now, I'll give you two examples. Hong Kong is a colonial-style economy, i.e. it's dominated, it, it, it's a, not a competitive economy, it's an oligopolistic economy. It is dominated by the tycoons. I mean, the reason why land prices are so high is because they can try control the supply of land. This is a huge issue for the Hong Kong population, and they've been building less and less houses and, and flats in Hong Kong. So this is a serious problem. and. Uh, uh, that, that, that will have to be addressed. The demonstration, you see, you see another thing, ba but basically the Hong Kong economy was a very free, this is prior to the handover, right, was a very free market, a, a certain kind of free market economy, but it, it was very retrograde in all sorts of ways. Huge inequality, which has got worse since the handover. So in no way would I condone the behaviour of the demonstrators. Disgraceful you know, destroying their own home. But you've got to ask the question, why? Why are they doing that? I mean, it, it's a madness. But okay, you've still got to ask the question, why? One of the fundamental causes is inequality in, 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 in Hong Kong. So, the task is to win over the Hong Kong population. There's no substitute for winning the hearts and minds. So, I think it's time for a serious rethink and a serious reset of policy uh, in Hong Kong to and towards Hong Kong. Whether the one country, two systems policy can last depends, it seems, on the effectiveness of the practice of the policy on the one hand and the confidence of China's ruling party in the policy on the other. In October, the fourth plenary session of the 19th CPC Central Committee asserted a new positioning that one country, two systems was one of the 13 significant advantages of the socialist system with Chinese characteristics and the national governance system. What signals does this move send to the world? One country, two systems has been elevated into an organic part of socialism with Chinese characteristics. It won't be easily changed as a system. That's why we remain committed to it and won't waver on this position. I think people should be rest assured if they have any concerns over the issue of this policy after 50 years. Once Hong Kong was returned to the motherland, the land was generally leased by the central government for a term of 50 years. Such a lease starting this year would expire in 2069. From this little indicator, we see that the central government is confident in the one country, two systems and expects to carry it forward.
While the elevated positioning of one country, two systems expresses the central government's confidence in the policy, is there room for improvement? In Macau, what new problems and challenges might the one country, two systems policy face in the future? Why have we seen some social unrest? Why has a segment of young people turned against it? Their actions show they do not fully appreciate their motherland. This sounded the alarm for us. Macau should never let its guard down. Some Western political forces, in particular, refuse to accept the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation or ideologically disagree with our socialism with Chinese characteristics. So at various times they interfere through Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan. These are not assumptions but the political realities that we have encountered and have to deal with nowadays. Besides, one of the main problems for Macau is its relative lack of industrial diversity. The tourism and gaming industries play a dominant role. For now, though, Macau's development is relatively healthy. However, the singularity of its industry carries high risks. If these interconnected industries fail, it would affect the stability of Macau's entire economy. So what we need to do is to develop new industries. As far as I know, the new industries are probably emerging through the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area cooperation. Coming up next, in China's new era, what is the new practice of one country, two systems? Will the new practice advance or undermine Macau's continuing development? What are Macau's future goals? What challenges does it face? All this and more next on Closer to China. The Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area is one of the most important integrated geographic areas in China and indeed in the world. It is an urban agglomeration composed of two special administrative regions, Hong Kong and Macau, and nine developed cities in Guangdong province, namely Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Zhuhai, Foshan, Zhongshan, Dongguan, Jiaoqing, Jiangmen, and Huizhou. The Greater Bay Area covers 56,000 square kilometers of land that has a population of over 70 million. His annual GDP is about 1.7 trillion U.S. dollars, 12 percent of China's entire GDP. If the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area were an independent country, it would be almost in the top 10 in the world. On February 18, 2019, Chinese authorities unveiled the development plan for the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, in which Macau would focus on building one center, one platform, and one base. Namely, building a world tourism and leisure center, building a platform for business cooperation between Portuguese-speaking countries and China, and building a base of cultural communication and cooperation with Chinese culture as the mainstream and multicultural interactions encouraged. In terms of geographic area and population size, Macau seems just a small dot, easily overwhelmed in the greater Bay Area. Nevertheless, Macau still shoulders heavy responsibilities in catalyzing strategic development regionally and even nationally. Embedding the one country, two systems policy, how does the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area stand out among other world-class Bay Areas, including the San Francisco Bay Area and the Tokyo Bay Area? The Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area covers 11 cities with more than 70 million people across 56,000 square kilometers. The biggest difference between this and other Bay Areas of the world is that it's a huge economy within one country, which spans two systems, three independent custom zones, and three currencies. The new integration practices of one country, two systems is evident in this open, vibrant area. What impact will the Greater Bay Area have on the future development of Macau? First, it could provide a vast hinterland for Macau as it occupies a small area with monolithic industries. Second, for Macau to diversify its economy beyond the gaming industry, the Greater Bay Area offers a huge playground of opportunities. On top of that, it's about the integration of relevant personnel. In the Greater Bay Area, the state issued meaning policies to enable patriots from Hong Kong and Macau to purchase property and join the social security programs there. 
Thus, more patriots from both places can enjoy the convenience of living and working in the Greater Bay Area, which may facilitate the understanding and exchange of people between the two systems. As just mentioned, the Greater Bay Area has three independent custom zones, three currencies, the product of one country, two systems in Macau and Hong Kong. Faced with such differences, how should Macau make use of its advantages to facilitate the construction of the Greater Bay Area and promote coordinated development? Macau is one of the four core cities in the Greater Bay Area. Undoubtedly, Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Guangzhou are all major cities. But what role can Macau play? It enjoys unique relations with Portuguese-speaking countries, where there are plenty of innovative enterprises. These enterprises need a good market to grow. That's where Macau comes into play. And in the past, Hong Kong was relied on by neighboring Shenzhen as an international financial center, but Macau was not. Then what can Macau do in this regard? As a free economic zone, Macau could serve as a center for renminbi clearing business, as well as a management center for offshore businesses of China's financial institutions, particularly for Portuguese-speaking countries. Let's analyze Macau's success in two parts. Macau's economy and China's one country, two systems principle. First, the dominance of gambling embeds risk. According to Macau's statistics service, casino revenues account for over half of Macau's GDP and about 80 percent of government revenues. Macau is building its tourism industry, 35 million inbound tourists in 2018, 70 percent from the mainland. Still, Macau's economy is vulnerable, subject to economic slowdowns which affect gambling and tourism, and to policy changes on the Chinese mainland, which has cracked down on corruption and extravagant lifestyles. Diversification is essential. Macau can be a bridge between Portuguese-speaking nations, especially Brazil and those in Africa, as well as Portugal. With respect to the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area integrated plan, the development of medical tourism and tech startups. Second, one country, two systems is working well in Macau. The growth of gambling, which is illegal on the mainland, is proof positive. Macau citizens manage their own affairs, society is stable, national identity is high. One cannot help but compare the stability and tranquility in Macau to the protests and turmoil in Hong Kong. While it is not the simple case that one country, two systems works in the former but not in the latter, there are no simple answers. There are obvious differences between Hong Kong and Macau. Size, sophistication, commerce, British versus Portuguese colonial rule. Nonetheless, Macau shows that China takes one country, two systems seriously, and that China is committed to its long-term viability. Understand one country, two systems to be closer to China.